Welcome back to the Rule Your Pool podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Eric Knight, with Arenda. This is episode 46. And in the last two episodes, we talked about water testing. Actually, Joe led those episodes, which was a nice change of pace. Um, I'm doing this one alone because we've been traveling, trying to get some material out. And uh, I was traveling in California and Reno two weeks ago and Florida this past week. And I heard in both markets, like Northern California and in Florida, some of the same questions. And I thought we could talk about it today. And and uh, as a little bit of an aside, um, when I was talking to these customers, the same topic that I've done several episodes on here before about pH naturally rising, thanks to Henry's law, the loss of CO2, still blows people's minds. I know it surprised me when I learned it, but um, it is true. This is a law of physics. And it makes a lot more sense when we understand that better. And I've done two episodes on it before. I don't remember the numbers at the moment, but you can go back and you can find them. Today, I want to talk about the opposite of that. I want to talk about those pools, if you have any, that the pH is not naturally rising that high. And in both markets, I had customers or potential customers, I guess, I don't even know if they buy my stuff, but um, they were asking questions in the class and they were saying, hey, well, what about that pool that, you know, I got a pool that doesn't rise up to 8.0 or whatever. It's it's 7.4 when I get back the next week. Hmm. Well, something's going on. And in this episode, we're going to talk about what those things might be. So episode 46, how can you suppress pH against its natural rise? Let's go. Welcome to Rule Your Pool the podcast by Arenda that explains and simplifies pool chemistry so that anybody, regardless of experience, can understand it. I'm your host, Eric Knight, bringing clarity to these subjects so that you can bring clarity to your water. If you're ready to rule your pool, then let's go. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, let's start with Henry's Law. I know we've talked about it in a few other episodes, but it is worth reminding. Uh, Henry's Law, again, a physics law, not a suggestion, is stating that any gas dissolved in a liquid is going to equalize with that same gas uh, based on pressure above that liquid. So if you've got CO2 in your drink, okay, we're going to use the example of a beer or a soda, a carbonated drink. Um, When you open that drink, you feel a little bit of pressure escape. That's because the, the drink was perfectly balanced with that little pocket of air under the lid. But when you open it, because there's more CO2 proportionally based on pressure, there's more CO2 in that liquid versus the room, it now has to equalize with the room. And so CO2 has to escape. And it it does so somewhat violently, if you think about it, because you see head foam on your beer or you see uh, big, big bubbles coming up to the top in your soda. So When that happens, there might be liquid in the way, but CO2 has to equalize. That's Henry's law. Okay, now you could uh, put the cap back on and stop that, kind of like a two liter bottle of soda. You know, you could recap it, put it back in the fridge, and it'll stay mostly carbonated. You know, because the carbonation equalizes again with that little pocket of air. Now, it's not quite as carbonated as when you bought it, but it's still carbonated enough to be uh, fizzy. Uh, If you just leave your beer out, or your soda out for two hours, especially in a cup versus the little bottle, because you only have a, a small little opening on a bottle, it's going to go flat. And it's not going to be very carbonated because Henry's law took over, CO2 equalized. And in pools, because CO2 is a good way that we know what the pH is, technically the pH is the concentration of hydrogen ions, but for practical purposes, the amount of CO2 dissolved in your water determines your pH. So as CO2 escapes, your pH goes up, okay? That's telling us that when Henry's law reaches equilibrium, meaning when CO2 and the CO2 above the pool equalize, you are at a place of equilibrium, meaning your pH is at what we call at Arenda, the pH ceiling. That's as high as it can go. Now you can force pH to go higher, you know, if you etch cement and you pull out calcium hydroxide, or you have sodium hydroxide introduced or something like that, and you're not negating that with acid, yeah, the pH can go a little bit over that. But if you go over that, the atmosphere is going to literally push CO2 back into your pool. Okay, now you don't see the bubbles like you do in a drink because, well, you have infinitely more surface area compared to the opening of a bottle. You have your whole pool surface area, and you don't have nearly as much carbonation. 
And you might be wondering, well, I don't carbonate my pool. Where did it come from? That was actually a question I got this week. And it's a valid question. Well, some, first of all, some pools actually do carbonate. They inject CO2 as pH control, which is exactly what happens to drinks. Now, you're not injecting nearly as much as you would into a drink. But yeah, there are pools that do inject carbon dioxide. And the reason that happens is because you're, when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, you create something called carbonic acid. H2CO3. That's a CO2 plus an H2O. And that kind of fluctuates with free CO2 and free water. And uh, it's in a sort of equilibrium. And then as the pH rises, you lose a hydrogen and that H2CO3 becomes an HCO3, which is called bicarbonate. Now you start to get alkalinity. As a bit of an aside, if you're ever doing a hot start, um, they try to tank the pH, which by the way, Arenda does not recommend hot starts on a startup because that's really an exposure method and it can kind of butcher your surface, but it looks great in the short term, but you know, it also opens up the pores for problems down the road, neither here nor there. You're trying to get the pH below 4.3 so that it's all carbonic acid in the water, not bicarbonate alkalinity. Therefore, it doesn't have the mechanism to rise the same way and it exposes the surface. So I actually have a chart here that I'm going to show you. And uh, well, for those of you listening, it's an alkalinity chart and you can find it in a lot of our articles on blog.arendatech.com or just go into the Arenda app, go to articles, type in alkalinity. It's in all of those blogs. And this is the alkalinity equilibrium. And it looks like a, a chart. Uh, well, I don't know, sound waves, maybe I don't know how to describe it. But basically, this is the equilibrium of bicarbonate and carbonate alkalinity. And what I really want to show you is below 4.3. That's carbonic acid. So if you are at, say, 7.5 pH, you're going to be in that gray pool chemistry range line that we have indicated there. That's where your chemistry should be. And as you can see, most of what you have in your pool is bicarbonate ions. You do have a little bit of carbonic acid, though, and these fluctuate in equilibrium. The higher the pH, the less carbonic acid, etc. And if you get over 8.3, bicarbonate ions convert into carbonate. You no longer have any carbonic acid. Now, if you are listening to this, that sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of words that can confuse you, and that's that's fine. If you look at the chart, it'll make a lot more sense. We want to make sure that we don't let our pH get over that threshold of 8.3. Now, in most cases, your pH ceiling is not going to be as high as 8.3 unless you have far too much carbon and alkalinity in your pool, which determines your pH ceiling. So we're going to stay below that because we don't want scale formation. We don't want bicarbonates to convert into carbonate ions because carbonate ions perfectly attract to calcium ions. And that's when you get calcium carbonate, cloudy water, scale, dust, etc. So if you lower your pH ceiling, you don't come close to that threshold. That's a good target. Uh, and this is what we teach. This is how we contain pH. We want to make sure that we don't get up that high. We want to limit our pH ceiling on purpose. And we're going to compensate for that with more calcium hardness on the saturation index. I know this is somewhat advanced, but the people who asked the question, uh, well, actually there were several of them. This needs to be understood at a basic level to understand what I'm about to teach. So that's why I'm kind of recapping this because it, it's going to make perfect sense if you can conceptualize the fact that the pH determines what type of alkalinity you have. If you inject carbon dioxide, and I think we'll do a full episode on just CO2 injection, Think that's worth it. You just add more carbonic acid, basically. But you might be wondering, if you need more CO2 in your water to lower your pH, which you do, how does acid create CO2? I mean, acid, muriatic acid is just hydrochloric. There's no CO2 in it. It's HCl. So how does it get it? Well, if you look at this chart, bicarbonate is HCO3. Inside a CO3 is a CO2. And by throwing another hydrogen onto it, you pull this to the left, uh, pull yourself to the left in this chart, and you create carbonic acid because you are actually, how, how I say it, you're burning through alkalinity with acid to create more CO2, which drops the pH. This is why your alkalinity goes down and your pH goes down when you add acid. Whereas if you just carbonate the pool, by injecting CO2, your alkalinity doesn't go down at all. In fact, it can actually go up if you have liquid chlorine or a salt pool or calhypo because of the excess uh, 
hydroxides in those chlorines. But you can just inject CO2 and bypass this whole thing. You don't have to burn through alkalinity because you're just going to create more carbonic acid directly. But if you add acid, you got to pull that CO2 out of your alkalinity to lower the pH. So that is the real concept here. And before moving further, I'm going to show you where the pH ceiling is. And I'm going to put that on the screen as well. This is also found in our article called Contain pH Versus Controlling It. Uh, Henry's Law. If you just search on blog.arendatech or in the article section of the Arenda app, you will find this chart. And I made the, the uh, chart the size of a phone screen. So if you open it up on your phone, you can just screenshot it and save it. And you will see that the lower your carbon and alkalinity, the lower your pH ceiling. So at about 80 degrees, let's say you have, um, hmm, let's say, well, carbon and alkalinity again is corrected alkalinity in this case. So you're going to take a, about a third of your CYA, your stabilizer, and deduct it from your total alkalinity. So let's say you've got 90 total alkalinity and you've got 60 stabilizer. So you take a third of 60, that's 20. Subtract 20 from 90 and you get to 70. And at 80 degrees, your pH ceiling is 8.27. Now we didn't make this up. We actually got this from Richard Falk. I'm not exactly sure where he got it from, but we trust that it's real. Uh, if we can pass the Richard Falk test, then we're good to publish because he will correct us if we're wrong. Uh, Richard, if you're listening to this, thank you for that. Thank you for this chart. So uh, the lower your carbon and alkalinity, the lower your pH ceiling, which means you have less risk of bicarbonates converting into carbonate and forming scale. This helps you manage your LSI. Here again, you can't just lower your alkalinity indefinitely. Okay, if you don't have enough alkalinity, you don't have a buffering capacity. And anytime you add acid, you can be making huge swings that you shouldn't otherwise be making. So you always want to measure your alkalinity before you make a pH correction because your, your acid dose is directly proportional to your total alkalinity. But I think that's a topic for another day. I think, and actually, I think we talked about that in the first three episodes too. Okay, now... How can we get in the way of this? We know that pH is trying to rise. We know that CO2 has to escape and equalize with the, with the air above the pool. We all share the atmosphere. And believe it or not, there's actually a very small percentage of CO2 in the air. So CO2 has to escape. You get up to the pH ceiling. How do we stop that? That's the topic of this episode. So let's go back to the analogy of a beer. What can you do to stop it from going flat? Think of it that way. Don't think about pH. What can you do to stop the loss of carbon dioxide? Well, the first thing you could do is you could put a lid on it. You can cap your beer again, right? You can't really do that in a can, but you could put the cap back on a beer. It won't be quite secure, but it's going to help. You know, it's going to stop it. You could, I, I guess you could put it in another bottle and screw it tight and, you know, leave it so that CO2 cannot escape. Yeah, that'll preserve it from going flat. It won't be as carbonated as it was when it was originally opened, but it'll stop the loss of CO2. How do we how do we do that on a, on a uh, sorry how do we do that on a covered pool? You simply close the cover. If you have an automated cover, this is one of the big questions in Northern California. If you have an automated cover and it's not a mesh cover, it's like a safety cover that's solid. Yeah, that's capping your beer. So that's the first way you can suppress pH is cover your pool. The question is, do you want to suppress your pH all the time. Some people might see that as an advantage. And I, you know, there's an argument that could be made if you know what you're doing that, yeah, you know, you could cover your pool and it could be an advantage. It's not so much of an advantage if it's a saltwater pool. It's not so much of an advantage if you have an acid feeder, because again, you are interrupting the process of Henry's law. You're blocking physics, so to speak. And what's going to happen is if you continue to feed acid or you continue to produce chlorine on the, on the salt cell, there's a lot of things going on in that water and there's no outlet for it to equalize. You've capped your beer. So if you do have a solid cover and you're listening to this, one thing I would recommend is if the, if the cover's on, be thinking very critically about if your acid feeder is also on. This is something you should talk to a pool professional about. Don't try to DIY this. Um, these intelligent control systems nowadays can be programmed pretty well. I mean, a lot of them can be programmed from your phone. Let a pool professional help you with this. They can talk to the manufacturer and figure out what's right for you. But I see a lot of problems in this country with covered pools 
that continue to run chemical automation. It's, it's because the chemical automation doesn't realize the cover's closed. Your equation changed. You capped the beer. So what's happening is you might be overfeeding acid. That could be one thing. Uh, you might be overproducing chlorine. That could be another thing. And there's no outlet for the byproducts of that chlorination to get out. There's no outlet for CO2 to escape. So a covered pool has a lot of benefits for water savings, heat savings, all that stuff. You just have to be aware of the chemical consequences and adapt to them so that you don't have those consequences to the same degree. If you're going to cover your pool, for instance, I'm not running my salt chlorine generator with the cover closed. I'm just not. Okay. Usually if it's closed, um, I can time it so that if I know when I, when I open that cover, I can start firing the salt cell again. If it's in season, if it's out of season, the water's probably too cold anyway. This is my opinion. This is Arenda's opinion. This is between you, you know, how kind of how they say in the news it's between you and your doctor, this is between you and your pool professional. If you were a DIY homeowner, I strongly suggest you do not try to do this yourself. Talk to the manufacturer, figure out how to do it. I cannot make recommendations on that because I don't know your system. I'm just telling you I see a lot of problems. I see a lot of pool surfaces that get sacrificed, etched, turned white, cloudy, whatever. I see a lot of this. Okay, And, and I thought you know it was just in cold water that was doing it. Shame on me. It, it doesn't have to be in cold water. It's a suppressed pH environment. That's the issue. So that's something to consider. You could cover your pool. Another thing, how else can we suppress? How else can we keep the pH from rising naturally? Well, ultimately what I've come up with, and I could be wrong on this, there might be a fourth, but I've only been able to think of three real world examples of how this can happen. The first way, of course, I just mentioned, you can cover your pool. And by the way, that doesn't have to be an auto cover. That could be a solar blanket. That could be, um, hell, it could be a piece of saran wrap a really big piece of saran wrap or a tarp. As long as it stops the CO2 from escaping, there you go. Don't put a piece of saran wrap on your pool, I should say that. No, nobody would see it. It would be a disaster. Don't do that. But you get my point. You're just blocking CO2 from escaping. Ugh, it's kind of scary to think about saran wrap. I was a swimmer, and I jumped in. This was a big mistake, but I'm going to tell this story because you know I'm a bit ADD here. They had a, a solar blanket. like It looked like blue bubble wrap. And we had practice. This was in Florida training camp. It was January. Cold morning, but the water's warm, and you can kind of see the steam seeping out between the cracks of this solar blanket that we had to roll up and remove. And uh, I think I was freshman or sophomore. It seemed like a good idea. How far can I run across this thing? You know, it seems like it would hold my weight. It doesn't. Now, granted, I'm, I was a collegiate swimmer at the time. And the pool was only six feet deep, and I'm six seven, so I I was able to stand up. But I, if I were smaller, I got wrapped up in that um, bubble wrap, and that could have potentially, you know, restrained me. It could have been bad. I might have been able to get stuck or drown. Don't do that. Don't run on it. So, not that I'm suggesting any of you would, but uh, it just kind of sparked that in my memory. It was a bit of a scary moment. So, anyway, how else? Can you suppress your pH? How about an acid feeder? We just mentioned this a little bit with the cover, but if you have chemical automation, its job is to, uh, is to maintain a pH. And the way these kind of function, and I'm going to say this lightly because I've talked to all the major manufacturers about this, and they are working on it to their credit. Let's see if they can figure it out. This is my challenge to the industry. Uh, they are basically running on a, a system called sense and dispense. Think of your thermostat in a home. It, uh, it's trying to maintain a given temperature or a small temperature range. And so when the temperature changes, the machine does something. It either cools down the air or it heats it up. Same thing kind of happens with an acid feeder. Since pH naturally rises, it only has one correction to do because it's not going to feed bicarb to bring things up. The pH is always going up. So it's only going to have to bring it down in one direction. As the pH rises, it feeds acid. The challenge that you have with an acid feeder is it, it's time. How do you know how long it takes for that acid to get through the 30-some feet of piping to the pool, adjust the pool, and then get pulled through the main drain or the skimmer, and then get back to the equipment pad to hit the pH probe to let you know that the pH just dropped? There's a lot of time in there. 
And typically what happens is these acid feeders overfeed because of that distance. Now, to the uh, manufacturer's credit, they are working on this. I think there's going to be a better thing that we can figure out that time and we can get these doses a little bit more precise. By and large, they're pretty good to begin with. So it's not a knock on any of the manufacturers. They're all made this way right now. Uh, there's something that is far more advanced now called proportional feed. That's a wonderful feature. It's getting there. It's getting close. But on a residential pool, you still want to know the volume of your pool so that you can actually calibrate that in. And this is what they're working on so that you know the exact acid feed to make a given correction. I'm very excited about this. If this happens, it's going to absolutely change the pH containment game uh, for the entire industry. It will be wonderful when this gets figured out. And I, I'm not the engineer. I'm not going to be the one to figure it out. But I bet they're listening to this, and I've already spoken with them. So get that figured out. It's going to be awesome for pH control. Another thing is uh, you can inject CO2. So it doesn't have to be an acid feeder. It could be a CO2 feeder. There's a challenge with CO2, though. As we mentioned earlier, you know, it's kind of like carbonating your drink. It doesn't last very long. Now, it also doesn't reduce your alkalinity, which is great. If I had a pool, which I don't, if I had a pool, it would have a CO2 feeder on it, and it would have a small acid feeder only used when I need to bring the alkalinity down. Okay, but I would predominantly use CO2. But there are some consequences of that. I mean, CO2 pools tend to have more algae because you have a lot more CO2, which is a nutrient for algae. We're not going down that conversation, but it's a, it's a trend for real on, on outdoor pools especially. But what if you could keep that CO2 in solution longer? Now, there are technologies being introduced. There's one that dissolves it a lot better rather than just diffusing it through a mozzie or something simple like that or a venturi, which are uh, delivery devices for gases. And, you know, normally CO2 is only in the water for a few minutes. What if you could keep it in for a few hours? That would change the game. That would give you a lot more, um, I hesitate to say control over pH, but it would give you a lot more time of adequate carbonation, etc. So you can make it more predictable. So that's another way you can inject CO2 or acid that would suppress it because you're reversing Henry's law or you're, you know, keeping it stable. The third way is using trichlor which is an acidic chlorine. So when someone says, oh, when I come back after a week, the pH is always 7.4 or 7.5. Mm. Okay, either you have extremely low alkalinity, meaning that your pH ceiling is very low. Because if you go back to that chart, the lower your carbonate alkalinity, the lower your pH ceiling. Or maybe you have really high cyanuric acid, which also deducts against alkalinity and therefore your pH ceiling is low. Or you're using trichlor, an acid feeder, a CO2 feeder, or you're covering your pool. Those are the only things. Now, I break those into three categories there. Um, those are the only things that I can think of that would suppress your pH. So if your pH is not rising up to about, you know, high sevens, low eights in a given week. Uh, by the way, that, that's in season. The colder the water, the slower this happens. So it might be two or even three weeks if your water's, you know, 60 degrees or colder. So just keep that in mind. Colder the water, slower it works. But um, yeah, I mean, if it's not rising there, you probably have one of those things. If you don't, contact us. Info at arendatech.com. Um, we want to figure out why. Maybe you can add to this list of these three things that I could think of. I know it sounded like more than three, but in my mind, these are all in the same kind of three categories. I would love to learn. I would love to learn. And this is a challenge to all of you out there that have a chemistry degree or a chemical engineering degree or physics or anything like this. Uh, if you can explain to me, uh, because I don't know it, this is what I'm saying. It's not a challenge to you. It's, it's more like, please, I'm inviting you. Teach me because I would love to share this with the industry. If you can explain to me why um, this rate of CO2 transfer changes, you know, given temperature or whatever else, it'd be very helpful. Specifically, we have found, and we're going to do another episode on this, but we have found a lot of success with having a good ratio of calcium and alkalinity. A lot more stability, a lot more predictability. We have found, uh, what well, we recommend, based on field experience, a minimum of three to one calcium to alkalinity. Now, this originally came from a guy named Tom Carrico, who is a he calls himself the the poolologist. He's actually a, a brilliant 
a, uh, a brilliant commercial pool guru uh, out of Wisconsin. And he told me about this, that a guy named Dr. Jim McNamara many years ago said the ideal ratio of calcium to alkalinity for carbon dioxide injection is four to one. The problem is I can't find anything published by Dr. McNamara. Uh, I'm taking him at his word. But at the time when I heard this, I thought, okay, I'll keep that in mind. We started recommending it. Oh my God, it works. It's incredibly powerful. I mean, it, it makes pH control or a containment, I should say, so much easier. When we don't have a good ratio of calcium to alkalinity, problems occur. Like if you're below two to one, water starts to tinge green. We have no idea why. Please explain that to me. If you know, and, and by the way, these pools tested zero for copper. There was no algae. It would be really nice to know. We've flipped green pools to blue simply by adding calcium to get that ratio in line. There's something to this. We're not the chemists. We don't know. So I'm challenging any of you listeners out there. I've had several homeowners reach out. One, uh, here, I know you're listening. You're a chemical engineer out of Utah, retired chemical engineer. I have learned more from you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing these things up. So if you know this information, you can help us get better. Much appreciated. That's how we grow. That's how we share this stuff. Because at the end of the day, we don't own any of this information. We're just trying to share it so that you can rule your pool more effectively with less waste, less stress, less chemicals. I'm Eric Knight with Arenda. This has been episode 46 of how you can suppress pH against its natural rise. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to Rule Your Pool, a podcast by Arenda Technologies. For more information on what we discussed in this week's episode, check the links in the description or visit www.arendatech.com. I hope you find this show valuable enough that you tap that subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can also like us on Facebook and social media. And with our help, you'll be able to rule your pool without over-treating it with chemicals and wasting money. I'll see you next episode.